pray. Lord, we're so glad that you have proclaimed that when we call on your name, you save us. You put us back together again. And we confess that we need to be put back together again as much as we want to deny, maybe minimize and rationalize. Our hearts do ache because things aren't right, because death reigns and grief Grief lives in us as a sign that things are not right. And so we call on you, King of kings and Lord of lords, to make things right. We call that you would bring healing to hearts that are laid low with grief, that your Holy Spirit would come and move in our midst, lifting grief off, and placing within a spirit of peace, a spirit of hope, help, healing. Father, we, I pray that, that you'd, you'd move and do what only you can do. Many have lit candles, a, vis a visible sign of an invisible prayer that in that dark place, that you would shine your light and cast the darkness far from them. Father, we pray that. Would you do that in your children gathered here in this place? In Jesus' name, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, maybe you can see over here there's a big beautiful gift box, and inside the gift box um, is a wonderful gift. And we find that there's a name on it this week. It's called Wonderful Counselor. And uh, if we read Isaiah, he gives this incredible prophetic word. He says in Isaiah, Isaiah says this, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So the whole premise of the scriptures, the Bible, is that we need a savior and we can't save ourselves. That we need an outside source to come in and do what only a savior can do. Isaiah is saying that there is one anointed, God's anointed savior, one who is going to be born, one who's going to establish a government, and, and it's going to be a government that brings peace, that in and through this Savior, things that are wrong will be made right, things that are unjust will be made just. And we're told that his government will last for all eternity. So as we read Isaiah, we're told that this Savior is one to be born, a human being. But more than that, of the line of David, a Jewish boy. We're told the mission of this Messiah that there will be a government, that he will reign as a king, that he will have a kingdom, that he will establish it and uphold it, that the kingdom will be about justice and righteousness and will last for all eternity. In order for us to define who that king might be, we're given names. Not just one name, but we're given four names. And in the Bible, a name is, represents a characteristic of that particular person. And we're told that this Messiah would be known as Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah is lifted up by God. 
given this prophetic word to proclaim to the people of Israel so that there might be a beacon of hope in darkness, in a dark time. This Savior would be born far down the history, 800 years down the road. But this beacon of light, this hope of God, a Redeemer, to redeem a world that is broken and dying, is lit in the hearts of people through this prophetic word given to Isaiah. We have a beacon of Jesus returning. The scriptures point to a day when he will come back and the kingdom that has been started, established, will be defeated. That justice will finally be realized and righteousness would be known. And so we hold on to a hope before us just as the people of Israel, before in Isaiah's day, held to a hope of a Messiah. We're told in Revelation 21 that there will be a day when there is no more sea, no more turmoil, where there will be no more death, where God will dwell with his people in intimate fellowship so close to us that he can wipe away our tear. In fact, there will be no more tears, no more death, no more sorrow. There'll be a new heaven and a new, new earth and everything will be established and righteous and right and just. That's what we hold on to, a coming day. And that gives us hope in a day that is filled with things that are not right and just and with death. So we want to work on the next four weeks at unpacking, is Jesus really a wonderful counselor? Is he the one that, in whom Isaiah was pointing to? And so to do that, um, we need a definition of what a wonderful counselor is. So I, I went on the internet and uh, I found out there's a guy named Don, Don Locke. He's the Dean of School of Education at the Mississippi College, and he's the past president of the ACA, the American Counselor uh, American uh, Counseling Association. So he's, he's a guy that knows stuff about counseling. <laughs> and so he writes, he says, what makes a great counselor? He says this, truly exceptional counselors are those who live what they teach to others. They walk their talk and practice in their own lives that which they consider to be most important for their clients. So, does Jesus walk his walk? Does he practice what he preaches? One of the great preachings, his very first preaching, was that he asked people to follow him. That they are no longer to follow in the ways that they think are, are right and just, but they're to follow in what he defines as right and just. Not about doing their will, but to do his will. And uh, he begins to define his way as a, a, a way of forgiveness, overcoming, forgiving. How many times should you forgive? They say, well, seven times 70, Jesus says. He says, stop even counting. Just exercise a forgiving heart. He calls them to generosity. If someone asks you for something, just, just give it to them. No questions asked. He calls for moral excellence. He says, if someone, the Old Testament said, if uh, you're not to murder, I say you're not to be angry with your brother. The Old Testament says you shouldn't commit adultery. I say you shouldn't even look with lust on another. But Jesus was calling them to follow him and his way. But who was Jesus following? I mean, if he was to walk the walk, he was saying he was a higher authority in which his disciples needed to follow. But who was the higher authority that Jesus was following? Was he following anyone? We hear in John's Gospel that Jesus says, indeed, he was following his Father. He says, I only say what I hear my Father saying. I only do what I see my Father doing. Jesus would have this tested in the Garden of Gethsemane when his Father would ask him to give up his life. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's praying and tears are, of blood are dropping from his cheek, he cries out to the Father, he says, If you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. And he followed 
right onto the cross. Jesus teaches by example humility. Jesus was never about his will being done, but about his Father's will being done. Not my will, but your will be done. And he calls us to this standard. It's not about doing our will. He calls us to take his wonderful counsel and to make it our will. To be a great counselor, well, it's to walk the walk, to to live out what one's preaching. So I would think that Don Locke would look at Jesus and say, you know, he actually does walk the walk, and he tells people to follow him, and, and he's telling them to be under his authority, and Jesus himself was under the authority of his Father. He humbled himself. But uh, I would say there's probably more to being a great counselor. Uh, You can have integrity maybe in your preaching, but you may not, your preaching might not lead to a righteous life. Do you know that his counsel, Jesus' counsel, written in the Bible, uh, has always been the number one selling book of all time every year. It's the most bought book, most translated book, the most studied book. 2,000 years later, we are still studying Jesus' teaching, and it's still new, it's still fresh, it's never been improved upon. I mean, think about anything that's lasted 2,000 years. Think about any technology. I mean, we know, I mean, we don't still use chariots, and we still don't use the theories of physics that are 2,000, they may be 2,000 years, but we've improved upon them, and yet you won't find anyone really improving upon Jesus' moral teachings. You see, he he doesn't only just walk the walk of humility following his Father, but his counsel, what he speaks, is flawless, is perfect. It's just justice. It's righteousness. When you walk in it, it brings peace. But you know what makes Jesus a wonderful counselor? Um, He doesn't just tell us how to live in a way that's righteous. But he, he sends us a personal counselor to be with us as we try to understand and comprehend his way, his will, in the nitty-gritty of our living. What does it mean to forgive? What does it mean to give? What does it mean to be generous? How does it apply in this situation? What does love mean here? Sometimes it might mean a a rebuke, and other times it means a hug. What does love look like? Don't you sometimes wish that you could take what is the teaching of Scripture and actually get some personal counsel about how it applies in your life? Well, in John 14, he says, These things I have spoken to you while I am still here with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send my, in my name, will teach you all these things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. John 16, 13 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he speaks not of his own authority. Even the Holy Spirit follows. Not of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he speaks, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. And he will glorify me, for he will be, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Not only does Jesus walk the walk, humbling himself and walking in the way of the Father, not only uh, is his teachings flawless and perfect, never to be improved upon, but he grants us a counselor, one who will open up the truth and help us to understand how it applies. And in fact, when the Counselor is speaking, when the Holy Spirit is speaking, as as we begin to pray and wonder, oh Lord, that tithing message, how does that work out? (laughs) You're supposed to laugh. (laughs) How do I do it? And is it true? And is it right? And and, and you have all these questions, and you wrestle with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit begins to make that truth known in your heart. 
And then you have this battle of Gethsemane where you, your will is known and his will is known. This great big battle happens and you battle until no longer my will but your will be done. And, and that's what Jesus has gifted us, that, that not only is this an intellectual exercise that he's given us, but he, he gives us the capacity to know truth, but more than that, he, he not only guides us in the right path, but he often carries us in it, carries us in it. He teaches us the way of the Father. He sends us the Holy Spirit. But I'll be honest, so often what makes Jesus Christ a great and wonderful counselor is this next attribute. After Jesus teaches uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he comes down, and, and you might not have seen it, but, but he, there's this incredible illustration of what Jesus needs to do after the Sermon on the Mount. I want to read from you. I want you to know that in the Bible, leprosy is uh, a, a sign of sinfulness. It's a, it's a metaphor for sinfulness. And so as Jesus begins to say, this is the way you're called to live, and you're to follow me, and as I'm under authority, you're supposed to be under my authority. I'm the king, and you're to listen to my decrees and begin to live them out. And as you do, you will find out what righteousness and what peace is and what justice is. And so live this way. <laughs> And then we try to when we find that what we do doesn't measure up to what he calls us to. And we find ourselves in that field of defeat. And this is what a great counselor does. When Jesus came down from the mountain, the mountain where he's teaching them, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy uh, was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for proof to them. <laughs> It's amazing when Jesus asks us, don't be anxious, we're what? Anxious. Uh, forgive, and what do we do? We hold on. Don't judge, and we find judgment. And we find ourselves with a sin condition. As much as we want to follow and bend our will so it's his will, it becomes a place of, well, of, we, we recognize our limitations. And then we remember the blessing that Jesus said first off in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We remember that, that the way of the kingdom is, is humility. It's to, to go and to Jesus, the great counselor, and say, I know you call me to do this, but I can't do it. And unless you are willing to make me like you, I'll never be like you. What makes Jesus a wonderful counselor, a great counselor, the Messiah, is that in that moment of humility, he breaks into our souls and gives us the strength to be a new creation. And again and again and again, as we're humbled before him, as we try to follow in his way, as we try to forgive, as we try to give, as we try to love, as we try to walk in the way in which the Holy Spirit is breaking open before us, as we try, we follow, find ourselves not having the capacity. And in that place where we are broken and we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to send us the Holy Spirit. And bit by bit by bit, we are being transformed. And that's where the kingdom advances. Jesus calls us to an impossible standard, and yet it is made possible by his intervention, by his help. Jesus' nature is one of utter humility. That's what he teaches. That's how his kingdom advances, through humility. 
Paul gets it. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He's saying that there's this mind, this there's teaching, there's this way of viewing yourself, which is in Christ. And this is the most significant teaching that Christ gives. It's a, it's a teaching in which he lives out. He walks. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestow on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. He's a wonderful counselor, isn't he? Isn't he wonderful? Don't you just want to look at Jesus and say, you're wonderful? He surrenders his life. It's not about his will being done. It's, he's following in the footsteps of his father, listening for his father's will and listening for his father's word and speaking that word so that the father can say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So he can even take and follow his father's will, even if it cost him his life. Isn't he a wonderful counselor? Because he teaches us his way of humility. He lifts up this kingdom way of justice and righteousness and peace and what it looks like. And he teaches us that. And as he begins to teach us that, he sends his Holy Spirit to help us to understand what it looks like in the nitty-gritty of everyday living today. But not only that, when we figure out we can't do it on our own strength, when we get humbled before the Lord, in that place, he comes and helps us. The humble will be lifted up. And soon we find ourselves more and more like Jesus. As we let him reign, his hope and heart begins to live in us and through us. Jesus walks the walk. What he preaches, he lives out. Jesus' counsel is right, never to be improved upon. It is holy, it is righteous, it is just. Jesus so loves us that he gives us a counselor. He makes sure that we have someone who can unpack truth 24-7 and guide us in the ways that are right, his way. And Jesus empowers us when we come to him and say, I can't do it in my own strength, but with yours. Oh, please make me a holy person. And as we humble ourselves and let him reign in our lives, we experience more and more peace. So the takeaway this morning is to come to the wonderful counselor and say, Jesus, is there anything in me that you would say needs some change? Is there any area of my life that isn't as you would will? What might Jesus say to you? And as Jesus speaks that word, as he humbly and graciously and gently reminds you of his highest high standard, as he convicts you that you're not living out that standard, as you feel the humility of that moment, Remember that that moment is to be followed with, Lord, if you're willing, you can change me. Oh, Lord, please change me. And in that humble prayer, the wonderful counselor comes and heals and restores you. 
so that his will becomes your will. His way, your way. So you no longer live, but he lives in you and through you. Let's pray. Father, you say that the greatest offering we can give is ourselves. You say, blessed are the pure and, uh, poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I pray, Lord, that we would not be a proud and arrogant people. I pray, Lord, that you can work in us, that your will would be our will, even when it costs us, especially when it costs us. Help us, Lord, to let you be our wonderful counselor, the one in whom we listen to, the one in whom we follow. Help us, Lord. Would you point out the places where we're missing the mark, where we're not living the way you have called us to? Would you speak that into our heart now and throughout the week? And I thank you, Lord, that as you do, we can cry out, Lord, make me clean, make me holy, make me like you. Work that in me. I can't change me. I know me. Lord, I know there's a Messiah and I'm not it but you are. Be my Messiah, be my Savior, be my Lord. Give me a heart that lives for you. Let me die to all the other cares of the world. And may I care only about one thing, that when I stand face to face with you, when you look at me, you might see your life fully formed that I no longer live, but you live, that I have become a servant of you, that you have been our King, our Savior, our Lord, our Messiah. Thank you for giving your life. Thank you for intervening 2,000 years ago and two minutes ago. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Lord to honor you, to follow you, to surrender to your will. Father, we ask that in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.